Joan Crawford, from the very beginning in her own life, realized that what she had to sell was her own glamour, her own good looks. Joan Crawford was often referred to, of course, as the ultimate star. She wasn't a trained actress. She lived these roles. They're imitating my mouth. They're imitating my darkened eyebrows. I don't do that. I'm me. I created a unique. And she couldn't see herself as a star of the picture who gets wiped out. She had to prevail. Crawford had a very masculine sexuality. She wanted that beautiful, romantic love. I don't think she ever found it. She said, when I go out on the street, I am Joan Crawford. If you want the girl next door, go next door. The Damn Don't Cry is loosely based in the story of Virginia Hill and Bugsy Siegel, who were real famous gangster in his mall in the 1940s. Siegel was heavy into organized crime back east. Sometime in the late 30s, he was sent out west and he eventually became part of the establishment of Las Vegas as a major resort and gambling mecca. In fact, the Hotel Flamengo was a pet name that he had for Virginia Hill, who was a mysterious figure herself, kind of a very wealthy socialite with a Beverly Hills address, but no background. I think the fact that this is based on reality and real people, glamorous, violent people, would pique audience interest. Also, Jerry Wald was the producer who got Joan Crawford into Mildred Pierce, and she ever after said she was very grateful to him. So she was delighted to have this package of Jerry Wald and this script and playing someone loosely based on Virginia Hill. The body of the notorious gambler and racketeer was found early this morning behind a sand dune three miles from the famed desert resort. Jerry Wald was into sensational, controversial material. He came from journalism, and you know journalism, I mean, they want something topical right now, what's happening, something that will sell papers. What will sell papers? Exploitation, sensational, forbidden stuff, and this was a chance to do that. And all the way through the picture, we get little snippets of official reportage or people trying to get to the truth of what's going on with this mysterious George Castleman and his mall, Lorna. How and why the obviously well-bred and cultured society beauty could be even remotely associated with members of the underworld is a question which baffles the authorities. Warner's was always very known for its sharp, snappy scripts, especially with dialogue read very quickly and, and snappy. You didn't waste any time, did you? I don't have any time to waste. So they had this experience of hard-boiled writing, and hard-boiled writing, you know, is very objective. Emphasis on nouns and verb, because it's quick, it's direct. You enjoy making a person look like two cents, don't you? Well, get this straight, I don't like being made to look like two cents. People don't have time to qualify in a Warner Brothers films, you know? It's this or it's not that. The night we started, you gave me 20. I learned from Grady it should have been 50. This just straightens out the bookkeeping. It does more than that, honey. It closes the books. I'm getting myself a new partner. While you're at it, you better get yourself a couple of other new items, if you'll excuse the expression. After the war, when film noir came back in a big way, uh, we got a lot of that, especially when James Cagney returned in a couple of gangster movies. The Dam Don't Cry definitely has that feel. Now, the way I got it figured, a guy who's satisfied, the guy's standing still. You're not standing still. You're moving backwards. Don't look that way from where I sit. It's where I sit that counts. From where I sit, I don't like what I see. The Damn Don't Cry really has the Warner look of the period, which was almost uniform. The movies launch quickly. They move very fast. There's no relaxing of the pace. They go from sequence to sequence, and then when they're over, they are over fast. It has that look, it has the feel of these very crisply shot scenes where there's no fat in any of them. One reason for this was because of the head of the studio's penuriousness. He felt that, you know, a movie that talks longer runs longer. A movie that runs longer costs more. Also the fact that it is embodied by Joan, who is always seen on the move, always moving, always doing something, always, you know, bursting out of this and going into that and trying this and trying that. That also gives the impression of movement, briskness. But I take my mother before I take you. Ah, oh, shut up. The original script, The Victim, was written for the beginning of a 16-year-old girl who was going to New York and trying to make good. And The Damn Don't Cry, of course, was a woman already Crawford was in her 40s, so it needed some readjustment. And uh, it turned out all right for Crawford. Joan Crawford's most famous and effective vehicles were always sort of a repatterning of her own life story that made her very popular because she was the identification figure for all these females out there who wished they had a life like she did. So when you construct a film around a star, 
what the writers do is they use elements and materials of a star's life because it goes without saying, a star will be better in this character if they know firsthand, if they've experienced it in their own life, what they are all about. And this is Joan. This role fit Joan Crawford like a glove by this point in her life. Joan Crawford had the range, she had the ruthlessness within herself, and also she could play housewife turning into a ruthless character. I'll show you, I promise. That's what you said when we were married. It's what you said when Tommy was born. It's what you've said every year since, but it's still the same. With you, it'll always be the same. Well, I've done the best I could. Well, it ain't good enough. She wasn't a trained actress. She lived these roles. And she certainly had been through enough in life that she would have identified with Ethel Whitehead and what she went through. Ethel Whitehead is this put-upon, miserable uh, drudge of a housewife married to a, a working man who doesn't appreciate her, who just yells at her for spending money. And she wants out of it so badly that uh, when there's a tragedy in her life, she takes the first opportunity to quit and try to start her life over and to accomplish something. Let her go, she'll be back. She'll find out what it's like. Whatever it's like, it'll be better than this. I want something more than what I've had out of life. And I'm gonna get it. But then when she goes to New York, she realizes that she needs to use her sexuality in order to achieve what she wants, being in a basically a man's world. And anybody that could make a peplum move like you don't need anything else. Well, in this film, it shows very clearly that what a woman in those days had to offer was basically her sex appeal, her looks, and if she was willing to trade on them, then uh, gaining power, money, position through sex. In gangster movie tradition, she uses sex just like supposedly James Cagney or someone might use a gun, which is the old saying. But the fact is, she's competing in a world that she conceives of as a man's world. Why haven't I seen you around here before? And she has to use whatever resources she has. Now, in whose name shall we write the lease? Mrs. Forbes. Mrs. Lorna Hanson Forbes. Forbes? Oh, yes, of course. Steel, isn't it, or is it tobacco? No, oil. That's why I'm leaving. Derrick's everywhere, even in the backyard. <laughs> and once she becomes the socialite, she, I mean, she creates, she and her, her mentor, create this, this persona. And only by creating that persona can she enter that part of society. Lorna is, well, of course, what you would call a social climber. She not only wants wealth, but she very much wants, as Joan Crawford did in real life, to be a lady, to belong in society. Joan Crawford, from the very beginning in her own life, realized that what she had to sell was her own glamour, her own attractiveness, her own good looks. No, save it for tonight. In her characters in her movies, and especially in The Dam Don't Cry, she's using this as a currency to get where she wants to go. Just what kind of a place in your organization did you have in mind, Mr. Castleman? It's too soon to judge yet. You'll have to see in which direction your capabilities lie. When you went to her films like The Dam Don't Cry, it is a Joan Crawford movie. It's not just she's in it or she's the leading lady. It revolves totally around her. And of course she has men in her life in these films, but all of these men are not stars at all. They're not even significant actors, they're B players. And audiences knew it. And audiences came out for Joan, it was a Joan Crawford movie. After all, you're responsible for this whole thing. I wouldn't have had the nerve. You don't need it, I got enough for both of us. Joan's relationship with her directors, which was off the set as well as on the set, had to do with the fact that Joan wanted to be liked. Joan wanted an audience. So how better to get an audience than to have the director love you, be in love with you. She did say herself, I think most of my directors have fallen a little in love with me, and that would give her more security, again, that he would be behind her on her side. Joan Crawford was definitely so in love with her image that she wanted total control over the way she was perceived. And having control over the movie, of course, means having a very good relationship with her directors. She really wanted to know that no one in that set could be favored over her. She wanted to be at the center of everything, and that's why she wanted to monopolize the attention of her directors. Hey, look out! Tommy! The death of her son shows her that living by the rules as she has been doing, perhaps to her own detriment, is not going to get her anywhere, especially after her innocent beloved son is killed. So from then on, morality is something for those who can afford it. 
She does have her own sense of values. She does know the difference between right and wrong. She, it's not that she doesn't understand uh, that she's breaking the rules here. I think she's breaking the rules that she sees as being unimportant. Don't talk to me about self-respect. That's something you tell yourself you got when you got nothing else. What kind of self-respect is there in living on aspirin tablets and chicken salad sandwiches? Look, Marty, the only thing that counts is that stuff you take to the bank, that filthy buck that everybody sneers at but slugs to get. It is a major turning point in the story because it's when they actually decide that they're going to get involved in organized crime. He's going to corrupt himself, take the fast money. He's doing it because he thinks he's going to get to stay near his sweetheart, Ethel. But she's doing it because she knows it's the first rung on the ladder to better things. She's quite a Machiavellian character. Toward the end, I felt that we needed some real violence in the picture. And I suggested that Crawford really get, get beaten up severely. It's a plan revolt. They're out to get me, aren't they? Aren't they? Yes. Stop it, George. It was quite courageous of Joan Crawford to let herself, a star, a lady, be beaten up to the extent that she was in this film. The character, played by David Bryan, George Castleman, is a killer, a brute. I mean, he's like a cobra, visually. He doesn't just slap her once or twice. He really beats up on her. You're so used to lying and cheating and double-crossing, you can almost make it seem good. <laughs> it's very rough at the end of the damn Don't Cry, and the violence is is pr pretty ferocious. It's the only punishment Lorna Hansen Forbes gets for her sins, really, so it gets dished out in a big measure. Now, even though the result is basically two smudges, one per cheek, and then a little bit of blood around the lips, it's a very brutal scene even today, and it is Joan Crawford being beaten up. Joan Crawford was fascinating in many ways, not only as a, a woman who sought a career and had a career, but in the choices that she made. Joan Crawford was Joan Crawford's star the moment she stepped out of her apartment. Now, some people found that a bit too much because this became her life, but on the other hand, that's all she ever wanted to be. And even now, years later, decades later, you can't take your eyes off of her on the screen. Joan Crawford was definitely the epitome of the glamorous Hollywood star who's based on an image which is manufactured. She believed in this to her dying day, and she used every hour of every day to promote this image. She was ruthless, and she achieved it, and she held her stardom longer than almost any other star, male or female. I met her in 1975. I spent an afternoon with her, cocktails. And for that three or four hours that I spent with her, I never once felt that she was not a star. More than that, the reigning star in Hollywood in 1975, the way she carried herself. Of course, it was a performance, but she was so into it. That's what she was in her movies, a performance it was. But she was so into it that it just intrigued and lit up the screen.